Hi everyone, thanks for joining us. Uh, well, welcome to the introduction to the first round of Platforms Projects webinar um, presented by the Australian Research Data Commons. My name is Kerry Levitt, I'm the Platforms Program Manager here. Uh, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of, of the lands that we are on today across the country. Uh, I'm on Ghana land and I respect the Ghana people's spiritual relationship with their country and I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are joining us today. So this webinar, uh, it, I'd just like to talk a little bit about the platforms program before we get into the project uh, presentations. So the platforms program is part of the ARDC's platforms and software theme. And what we're trying to do with this program is enable the development of e-research platforms that are transformative so we're looking to improve the way research is conducted or accelerate research. We are looking uh, to enable sustainable e-research platforms, those that have strong community support and that will continue uh, after the initial uh, project investment. We, we're really looking to expand the pool of Australian researchers that have access to platform technologies. Uh, so that's across disciplines and also the number of researchers in general. And we want to bring together the community of Australian platform developers and um, operators. So we're looking to support best practices um, and have the community support each other. So you probably most of you are here because you know about the platforms open calls. So I'm not going to talk about this. We did have a webinar, an overview webinar um, with a question and answer session last week, and that has been recorded. Um, this re webinar is also being recorded and I will send these slides out uh, to all registrants. So this slide is here just so you can follow the links. So on the open call page, um, we have added all the answers from that we gave in the webinar. We've transcribed those and added them to the frequently asked questions. And you can also find the request for proposal documentation on there. So I'd like to get started. I'd like to invite our first presenter today, which is uh, Sean Ross from Macquarie University, and he's going to talk to us about FAMES. Thanks, Sean. Thanks, Kerry. Um, so uh, FAMES, essentially, it's uh, we're calling it electronic field notebooks now. And I guess the place that uh, I would start to give you an idea of what we're doing is if your organization uses lab archives for laboratory work, we're looking at doing something analogous to that, but for offline or network, network degraded environment uh, field data collection. Um, and you can see here what our, uh, our um, uh, partners and uh, contact information for the project. Uh, I won't read the text here. I'll give you a few seconds to read that and then I'll give you some more context. So essentially what we're doing is we're trying to recognize the fact that, that field research, whether it's in uh, disciplines like archeology, span uh, oral history, ethnography, or in uh, field sciences like ecology or geology, uh, falls under a category uh, that in the literature is described as small science or small data um, uh, uh, research which uh, is characterized by its own difficulty. It may not get the press that big data does, but it's characterized by its own, uh, its own difficulties, mostly around heterogeneity and diversity of data. When we started this project in, tw in 2012, we thought we'd make data loggers or something like that. But what ultimately ended up happening was that that was just not suitable for our community. And so we built a much more generalized platform that I'll talk about in a minute. And that was just really necessary because of the nature of the research in these disciplines, because of its uh, characteristic, characteristic heterogeneity, and also the fact that, um, and again, something that comes up in the literature about this kind of research is that the field um, approaches, methods, the digital tools, things like that are often uh, emergent from field work, that it is uh, from the research itself, it's often quite hard to um, 
have a top-down designed system ready to go when you go out to the field. Uh, although we do try to work with our, uh, our, our our partners on doing data modeling to do that as much as we can. But before I start getting into the solution, let's go on to the next slide, and then I'll uh, and, and I'll start speaking to that. Um, so. What the uh, uh, solution is that we're looking at, and I seem to have, uh, see, all right, so what the solution is that uh, uh, that we're looking at doing here, uh, and this is based again on experience that we've had um, since, um, sorry, <laughs> yeah. So uh, the the key thing to understand about our, our platform is that, um, that this isn't an app that you just download and start using on the field but uh, in the field for data collection but what we've what we have done and what we hope to continue to do is to uh, produce a platform that lets you essentially mint your own custom app and do it in a way that uh, makes um, sharing and transparency in the sense of an encapsulation of your methodology being available in a more or less human readable uh, way that can be then interrogated by an outsider so we uh, we, we have um, we produce or researchers produce currently it's an XML file and future in the next version you'll see on the next slide it's probably going to be something more like JSON a, a, a document that instantiates a particular data model and a particular workflow out in, in, in the field so that you have the advantage of having a bespoke app, but instead of having to spend you know, six figures to have a, a bespoke app, app developed, this can be done by, uh, once the data modeling and workflow modeling is complete, it can be done by a student programmer in a week and costs you know, uh, five or $10,000 or something like that um, to, uh, uh, to produce. So, um, this uh, uh, at, and at the same time, the core technology that underlies each of these does a lot of the heavy lifting around sensor support, uh, synchronization, uh, providing an API or export uh, facility, etc. Uh, um, we are doing now a total technological re a total rebuild from the bottom up because the stack we're using now which was chosen in 2012 2013 has really reached the end of its useful life um it's it's stable it's in use it's been deployed at uh, for about for over 60 workflows at about 35 projects um but it's time for something new and um what we're looking to do is maintain the kind of flexibility that i've described previously but um do so in such a way that uh, is cross-platform. Right now we're Android only, so cross-platform, uh, more performant than what it is now. That uh, currently we use a relational data store database um, that uh, runs that that is quite um, uh, generalized. Uh, so it uh, we we hit the kinds of performance. Um, uh, bottlenecks that you'd expect with that. So we're looking at other solutions that aren't relational. Um, and uh, uh, we're looking at, uh, again, making it cross-platform, eliminating dependencies to the extent that we can, improving, uh, improving security, and doing a number of other things. So um, uh, that, that, again, are mostly around scalability, usability. Uh, we're looking at um, uh, we're looking at producing a web application uh, that if you're familiar with Qualtrics or maybe Lime Survey that, that provides you a GUI uh, along those lines to do your customizations that will then generate that JSON file that I had mentioned previously. So that's, um, that's a basic rundown. Um, and I think I've used up my three minutes, so thank you. Excellent. Thanks so much, John. Um, I, sorry, I forgot to mention at the start. So we've got Wojtek up next. Um, I forgot to mention at the start that please, um, participants, please put in your questions now. Type them into your question box um, and we will get try and answer them at the end. Um, but if you start entering them now in the order of the speakers, that would be really handy. So I'll hand over now to Wojtek. And he's, his webcam is not working, but he is on the line. Thanks, Kerry. Uh, so my name is Wojtek Kaczynski. I'm here to present the Australian Characterization Commons at Scale. So characterization is the process of probing and measuring the structure and properties of materials at the micro, nano and atomic scale. And it's essential across uh, natural, agricultural, physical life and biomedical sciences and engineering across a wide range of fields and domains. And uh, it is represented in the increase uh, in the increased field through Microscopy Australia, 
National Imaging Facility, ANSTO, and significant investments, of course, through uh, universities and other institutions as, as well. We do have a strategy that we've used to inform um, this project, and you can download that. The link is in the bottom right-hand corner. But the three major aspects are scale and complexity, working with digital objects is challenging, and expertise is rare. And so the project itself is addressing these through a national infrastructure program um, by helping to make characterization digital objects fair or more fair, and a national program to spread knowledge and underpin change. So the actual program itself is, is quite uh, broad across many, many different locations across Australia, uh, including three ANCRIS facilities. Um, it, and it is quite broad because characterization instruments are very distributed across Australia. They are typically in laboratories. What we're doing is deploying what we call the characterization commons. Um, and this is a suite of, or an ecosystem of computing systems, data repositories, workflows, services, and um, all connected with instruments. It is not one thing, it is a wide range of capabilities um, that are deployed across four locations in Australia. Alongside that, we have three specialized programs in uh, big data electron microscopy and correlative microscopy, in biomedical imaging collections, and national tools for scattering and beyond as well. The way that we're deploying it, or, or um, the, the things that we're actually, uh, we're actually doing are on the left-hand side here, and, and some of the techniques and, and technologies that we're using are on the right-hand side, and some of the things certainly that we'd be very interested in talking to people about. I'll, I'll go over the, um, the items on the, on the right. We're particularly doing a lot of work with instruments. So um, we have been underpinning and integrating instruments for many years, and uh, we have various tools and, and tricks that we use for that and, and, and environments. We provide min much of our software through a remote desktop environment available to um, researchers on the cloud. Uh, and we do develop environments uh, to provision remote desktops. We're planning to do a lot more CICD type work and containerization to make what we do um, of a higher quality, more redeployable and easier to share across other uh, environments and landscapes as well. We plan to do a lot of data movement because we do do a lot of uh, instrument based work. We have uh, the need to move data from instrument to somewhere better. Uh, so we will be working with a lot of instrument, uh, sorry, a lot of data movement tools. Um, and we're also looking to integrate with institutional research management and repositories. And that's really uh, because we consider that essential to our sustainability. We want to integrate with the actual ins uh, institutions that are supporting the instruments locally. Thank you, happy to take any questions at the end. Thank you very much, Boitek. Um, and now we have Louisa John. So thank you very much for the invitation to present um, the e-research institutional cloud architecture otherwise known as ERICA um, project. Uh, the problem that ERICA addresses is one we're all pretty familiar with, I think. There's numerous examples of uh, concerns around data breaches relating to personal data. The original idea for ERICA arose out of the issues that health researchers face, in particular in trying to use large-scale um, health records such as MBS or PBS claims or increasingly electronic medical records um, that come out of hospitals. Clearly there's a massive amount of research value locked up in those data but traditionally there's been many many barriers to actually gaining access to them rightly because of the need to protect privacy but increasingly there are also issues relating to the size of the data and the computing capacity that we actually require to apply techniques like machine learning to to these data which exceed the capabilities of, of existing secure platforms. So Erica is, implements one component of the, the five safes um, approach to protecting uh, the privacy of sensitive data which that diagram shows and in particular the safe settings component is directly addressed by Erica but it also provides mechanisms for implementing the other four safes as well. For example, we have a safe re researcher training program. And I just say that I think Steve McEachin is speaking later about the Cadre uh, project, which is a sister project of Erica and is also relates to setting up infrastructure to um, 
uh, operationalize those five safe principles. So what is ERICA? ERICA is basically uh, an orchestration framework. It's infrastructure as code. It's completely virtualized. As far as we know, it's the first um, facility uh, internationally that actually utilizes public cloud computing in a way that is secure enough to meet the requirements of Australian government data custodians. It uses Amazon Web Services or AWS. And as you'd all be aware, there's a huge number of features. Um, there's immense scalability. And with AWS increasingly, um, you know, a whole range of new uh, products and services are released, which we can take advantage of. Currently, we're already offering different operating system and workspace configurations, a range of different options for high performance computing, and there are multiple storage and pricing sort of options. Very quickly, there's four major components, project workspaces, um, virtual desktops through which the researchers access those workspaces. Um, importantly, for sensitive data, we have ingress and egress portals that provide complete copy audit trail and customizable permissions in terms of who is allowed to perform various activities relating to file upload and download. And then we have a system administration application. Um, because Erica is entirely virtualized, there can be multiple um, instances of Erica. Um, each one can host more than 100 projects. And currently there are three that are active, one at UNSW Sydney, um, and at UNSW we basically maintain the code base for all of the instances, which basically are sort of clones of one another. The other two current instances are the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare. Their instance is called the Secure Remote Access Environment, or SRAE. And then recently, the New South Wales Data Analytics Centre, which is a New South Wales government agency, has also established an ERICA instance. So what are we doing with our ARDC platforms funded project? We're basically growing the national ERICA network funded as part of the platforms project. We will be establishing three further ERICA instances, one in South Australia at the um, SAMRI uh, Medical Research Institute, one at University of Melbourne, one at the University of Western Australia. Um, it, it takes about six person days currently to establish an entire ERICA instance. Um, and we hope to have those three new instances up and running either late this year or early next year, noting that COVID has set our plans back slightly <laughs> in terms of being able to employ staff to work on the project. We'll also be exploring porting of, of Erica to run on Nectar cloud nodes, which may re reduce costs for some projects. And then there's a range of enhancements to the software, which basically are aiming to increase automation and reduce costs. And in particular, um, custom configurations for machine learning are becoming increasingly uh, sought after by researchers who are using Erica. And at the moment, we don't have um, highly automated processes for project archiving and restoration, and we'll need those. And then we're also working on developing five SAFEs enabled project governance pipelines, policies and procedures that are specific to ERICA, but also will be harmonised with the work that the Cadre platform is doing, which you'll hear about later, I think. In particular, in our governance work, we're going to be focusing on research using cross-jurisdictional data. It's a big issue in Australia that different jurisdictions have different uh, privacy legislation, for example. So we need to develop some governance and policies that will allow us to bring together data from Commonwealth and all of the state jurisdictions. And then the other thing we're interested in is using ERICA for international collaborations. What are the, the, the legislative and other requirements for researchers who are based in other countries to access Australian data? And we'll also be exploring the potential to set up ERICA instances in other countries because this is possible wherever AWS um, is operating. And the bottom of that slide, you can see the partners in the project. Thanks so much and happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Louisa. Okay, so now we have Ryan with the Australian Imaging Service. So I'll be talking about the Australian Imaging Service, um, which, as the name implies, focuses around uh, image characterization, but uh, I guess a bit differently to the ACCS 
focuses much more on clinical dark data. <clears throat> so roughly one third of the Australian population gets radiology images every year. Um, and about 3.3 billion is spent on obtaining these images. To uh, put that in perspective, that's about four years worth of the cumulative NHMRC funding for the entire country. <clears throat> now, wouldn't it be spectacular um, if there were a easier process to uh, actually use some of that clinical data for research purposes? And that, that's part of what this project uh, aims to facilitate. <clears throat> One of the options though with using that data is a lot of the tools and processes for de-identifying the data and moving it from a clinical site to a safe research site are very ad hoc. They're almost always built from scratch by the research group, um, which means they're very prone to errors. <clears throat> Let's not even talk about the ones using Dropbox. Um, outside of clinical formats, um, they're also a large variety of data formats with each vendor having a different one which makes it very hard to work with and of course there are a lot of related modalities to an imaging session electrophysiology blood work etc that you would also want to handle in the same way and lastly there's a lack of consistent quality assurance um, and provenance on the metadata which makes it very hard for secondary reuse because you don't know how trustworthy the data is so our approach is to build a distributed national federation of research repositories that are linked directly to clinical instruments and analysis tools. So four main streams. The first is we want to de-risk the data transfer. Um, so by using standard technologies to, to bridge the clinical and research sites, um, we can have much better control over the de-identification, access controls, um, and importantly, auditing, so that the clinical sites can actually see not just the first researcher, but all subsequent reuses of that patient's data. The second is making all of these, <coughs> excuse me, nodes, uh, trusted data repositories, um, having national imaging facility personnel uh, approve quality assurance and quality control processes, um, reproducible analysis pipelines, and importantly, in-depth reporting to see who's actually doing quality control, who's doing the proper analysis, et cetera. Third, um, the technology we're using XNet um, has historically come batteries included with DICOM, so it means it's more or less plug and play with clinical settings. Um, but as I mentioned, there are a lot of modalities um, that aren't included out of the box. So what we want to do is expand the support for arbitrary file types. Um, this includes cutting edge imaging modalities where the researcher may be creating their own file type <clears throat> and adopting open formats um, that the community has decided where that's, that's the way to go forward. And lastly, no platform should stand on its own. So we want to integrate with an ecosystem of tools used around imaging and radiology research. Um, it's cut off a bit, but this is in two categories, one internal, so everything can be initiated from the browser from within the Australian Imaging Service. And the second is external, where we provide an API and authentication mechanism to integrate with other platforms and services. <clears throat> um, so lots of colors. Um, what the Australian Imaging Service is, is all the capability inside the dotted blue line. So we deploy upload tools and de-identification tools at university sites and clinical sites that use a standard configuration and de-identification profiles for the entire federation. These will push to individual nodes using the XNAT platform which houses internal viewers for, for viewing the data, um, a pipeline engine, which leverages Docker, Kubernetes, Gadgetron, and Clara for image reconstruction, machine learning, and any uh, pre-packaged pipelines that might be appropriate. And importantly, a, an API that allows us to integrate with other platforms, such as Red Hat, the Characterization Virtual Lab, um, CERP, which is the 
I guess, equip, uh, an equivalent of Erica um, used over in Wales and the UK, which uses XNet as the main radiology um, component. And importantly, you. Um, you know, part of this talk is how we can integrate. Um, so there's a whole API that we would basically want to act as a national service to connect to the instruments and data in a secure way to be available inside other platforms. Um, and that's it. Excellent. Thank you so much, Ryan. Uh, now we've got Professor Stuart Barb. Thank you, Kerry. Um, so, yeah, I'd just like to spend a few minutes talking about the uh, Australian Transport Research Cloud. So this is um, a uh, platform grant that's been run out of Oran, which is the Australian Urban Research Infrastructure Network, a uh, NCRIS facility, but includes a multitude of uh, collaborations with uh, other universities uh, across Australia. Uh, and what we're trying to achieve in the uh, HRC project um, is two things. One is to start to develop and build a generic uh, capability for modelling and simulation across cities and urban areas within Australia, um, one which is uh, scalable, uh, interoperable and develops an ecosystem approach to, to model coupling uh, and analytics. Um, and in this particular uh, platform grant, doing that via a demonstration of how we can start to bring together uh, different transport models, analytic capability uh, and relevant data sets into a scalable uh, cloud uh, environment. So um, specifically about the ATRC project, um, we're focusing on transport because we recognise it's a uh, challenging area around um, uh, requirements for uh, infrastructure that we require cost effective and reliable and resilient uh, sustainable multimodal systems uh, to reduce emissions and uh, to reduce congestion um, and it's only by being able to generate evidence um, around uh, our performance of our transport systems um, that we can start to develop coherent policy and investment plans uh, into the future. And all of this relies essentially on high quality, timely data and the ability to be able to use that data to parameterize, calibrate and validate uh, interoperable spatial temporal models and analytics that allows us to uh, understand the performance of our transport systems. So what we um, plan to do or will be doing in the ATRC project uh, is we will be focusing on providing uh, new high quality multidisciplinary data sets for transport research across Australia, um, ensuring that that data is discoverable, accessible and also critically for the modelling and the analytics actually uh, presented in a manageable and ingestible way uh, for the analytics and models. We will, uh, on the analytics and modelling side, be developing uh, approaches for easy access to open source transport analytics and modelling tools from across the different research groups uh, in transport research across Australia and developing easy to use interfaces between data and the models and the analytics in order so that data can be ingested easily and straightforward into the models. And in order to do this, our sort of platform or the the infrastructure that we'll be developing um, will be based around uh, easy access to the data. So we'll be focusing um, on uh, accessible data based around uh, fair data set principles. Uh, and then also the, uh, the development of cloud enabled transport analytics and modeling that can leverage off uh, those data sets. And so the sort of, if you like, the little bit detail on actually how we're going to uh, do this. Um, Oren has an existing metadata catalogue, uh, which is uh, extremely rich in terms of the uh, disparate data sets across Australia. It has access to, uh, with regards to um, urban uh, areas and cities. Uh, however, we intend to uh, extend that to the DCAT data catalog recovery standard from W3C, 
um, which will increase the uh, accessibility and discoverability to uh, federated data across multiple sites uh, in relation to transport data. We're also going to extend ORIN uh, so that it can handle the uh, emerging data standards and metadata standards around transport uh, data, uh, so GTFS uh, and uh, uh, data that's coming out of AG, ASGS as well um, around the uh, statistical data uh, for Australia. And uh, take those data sets and allow them and meld them into uh, uh, manageable data cubes from APIs that allow us to present those to the models and the analytics, um, and then containerizing uh, and cloud deploying the actual tools, uh, the net transport network analysis tools and modeling tools uh, out into as cloud services um, for the research community. The other area that we're very keen to look at is around interoperability um, of these models and of the uh, analytical uh, workflow. And so we'll be looking at adapting Jupyter Notebooks um, and also using um, approaches like Apache Argo to allow us to do event-driven um, workflow containerization um, of the models in order to make them interoperable uh, between each other. So the overarching ambition of the, the HRC project is um, to develop this cloud-enabled modeling and simulation framework uh, around urban data science um, and focusing primarily in this piece of work around how we do that for transport research so that the tools and the models are made more uh, widely available to the research community across Australia. And uh, if you'd like to find out any more about the, the ATRC project, uh, then please feel free to either contact myself or Michael Rigby, who is the uh, ATRC uh, technical manager. Excellent, thank you very much, Stuart. Next, we have uh, Nigel Ward, who's gonna talk about uh, BioCommons. Thanks. Thanks, thanks, Kerry. I'm gonna spend the next three minutes um, doing two things. One is decoding the jumble of words in the title for our project there. And the second is maybe identifying some areas of potential collaboration with other partners. Um, so I'll start by uh, defining BioCommons. Um, it's a multi-year, multi-partner, multi-million dollar initiative um, looking at building digital infrastructure capability for the life sciences. It's got a variety of partners, a subset of whom are on this project, and you can see the, the logos for them below. Uh, so why does BioCommons exist? Well, um, like many of you, uh, life sciences, or like many domains, life science is experiencing a data explosion, um, rapid advances in sensing technologies, uh, speed of sensing technologies, capability, um, cheapness of sensing technologies, meaning we're seeing a data explosion like the one that you're seeing in that graph on the right, which is showing exponential growth in the data being, life sciences data being contributed to international repositories. So BioCommons was created in reaction to that. The platforms project I'm talking today about today is, is addressing three problems that, are, that arise from that data explosion. BioCommons is addressing many more. So the three we're trying to address with the, with the platform project, first is around providing researchers with access to the methods and tools and techniques that can help them analyze those data that I just described and deploying them on a variety of different infrastructures. The second challenge is to help researchers actually access those data. Uh, we've discovered that the data is, uh, is very distributed. Researchers might have it in their own lab. They might have it in an institution. It might be generated by a national collaboration like the BioPlatforms Oz Mammals Initiative, or it could, might exist in those international repositories. We want all of that data to be accessible from our platform. The third challenge we're addressing in the platform project is providing compute to underpin those analysis, analysis tools on that data. Um, uh, the Australian computing environment is quite complex. There's no com computational environment that's particularly tailored for bioinformatics and bio and life sciences. 
So we're providing access to, we aim to provide access to institutional, uh, national, commercial, and even someone's laptop underpinning this platform. So that's the three things we're trying to do. How are we, how are we doing it? And here I'm decoding two other, two other words. We're building what we're calling a bring your own data environment. And that's where the researcher can bring their own data and connect it with reference data, with those tools and techniques and the compute infrastructure. And we're doing that through three, three work programs, uh, which are building on existing, existing services, hence, hence the expansion and the title of the project. Um, we're building a bunch of GUI tools, graphical user interface tools on the, on the web to access commonly used tools like the Galaxy workflow engine. We're building a, a companion command line interface to, to that graphical interface for researchers who, who want to tinker with tools a bit, a bit more or, or might maybe extend the sort of um, analysis that can happen. And we're, we're having a major investment into getting data from all of the instruments that distribute around the nation through national investments into this platform. So they're the three activities we're undertaking. How are we doing that? We have a we have a principle that we're not building anything new. We're going to adopt existing technologies that are that are being created uh, internationally. Uh, maybe influence how they how they look internationally, but adopt them and de and de deploy them here rather than build anything new. And rather than go through all of that that word jumble here, I'll just identify a few areas that are for potential collaboration. Um, the Galaxy workflow engine I mentioned earlier is a generic workflow engine that was built for bioinformatics, but can be and has been used by other, other communities. Be really interested in looking how we could redeploy it for other communities. We're working with Arnet, as I know a number of you are as well, while using their cloud store program, uh, platform as a way of getting, letting researchers bring their own data in and out and getting data from those instruments into the platform as well. So be interested in collaborating there. We're working with um, a number of international projects such as the CERN Virtual Machine File System and the Genomic Alliance for, Ge sorry, Global Alliance for Genomic Health uh, Data Repository Service on distributing reference data internationally and tools and workflows internationally. And we're using a bunch of container technologies to provide access to the tools and making sure that they're deployed on ver a variety of uh, backend research infrastructures, things like bio containers, workflow engines like Snakebake and Nextflow that sit on top of Kubernetes. So hopefully I've de-jumbled the, 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 all of the acronyms in our, in our project title and given you identified a few areas where we could potentially collaborate. So I think that was three minutes, Gary, over to you. Thank you very much, Nigel. Okay, so next we have uh, Elisa from EcoCommons. Actually, we might go on to the next one because I think Elisa may have dropped off. So uh, well, I'm going to forward these slides and we'll come back to her when she can come back on. So next one, uh, hi. Hi, hi, hi Gary, thanks. Um, I'm Kumati, I'm from Monash University. Um, I'm going to speak about the environments to accelerate the machine, learn, machine, machine learning based discovery here. So this is a collaborative project between um, Manash, uh, the data science platform, Massive and the University of Queensland. So, um, so the, the, this project largely uh, addresses the um, challenges of researchers applying machine learning or researchers developing machine learning um, uh, techniques as a part of their research. Um, so as we are all aware the machine learning techniques are used widely across multiple range of domains right from neuroscience economic sciences to art and 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 uh, uh, business so the um this started with the ardc discovery activities um as part of the discovery activities we conducted a survey um across um multiple institutions within australia and new zealand um, we surveyed 128 research groups out of which 68 research groups responded uh, the survey largely focused on understanding the challenges of the researcher face in applying the data science and AI uh, uh, machine learning to their research. Um, so the, the graph summarizes the um, kind of challenges that the researcher face. Uh, the key challenges are identified obviously as a compute capacity and the environments to do their research. Um, data accessibility, the availability of data, sensitive data, uh, sensitivity associated with the data 
skills and expertise itself in, in applying machine learning and other other researches, uh, other challenges identified are the, the knowledge around techniques and, uh, and the communities itself. Um, next slide, please. Um, sorry, if I can just add one more there. So the um, the report from the survey can be found here. There's a link which has been provided there, and it's it's the report can be downloaded. So based on the challenges identified, uh, we put together a program of work for the platform project, uh, which primarily aims at uh, first accelerating the um, accelerating the research by first providing an ML environment in which the researchers can quickly um, do their research or, or possibly fail as well and, and understand how, how we can accelerate that part. Um, also promote the interdisciplinary research basically around the tools and the techniques and the libraries which, um, which the researchers from different domains use uh, and also to see how we can scale this across um, uh, multiple national partners like NCI and POSI. So the, pro the program of work involves around four uh, major activities. One is uh, developing that integrated development environment itself, uh, which has all the required tools, probably some reference data, SDKs, and libraries. Um, two is also improving the um, end of the day, the 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 uh, the underlying infrastructure are these um, expensive high performance computing. Um, so it's more about now utilizing the HPC itself in the most efficient way and also having that knowledge available across the multiple HPC centers and administrators. Uh, three is about providing targeted training to the research community more around tools and techniques and also around um, um, and also around developing these um, um, developing these tools and techniques uh, appropriate for their research. Uh, fourth is building the communities of practice, um, either around the domain of research or around uh, ar around the tools and techniques they apply in in their in their particular research. So uh, we created three work packages as part of this platform project. Uh, the first one focuses on uh, developing the integrated development environment, uh, which first is providing an interactive desktop. Um, uh, developing analysis workflow suitable for a, every kind of task that the researcher perform. Um, um, three is improving the link to file systems on HPC environment and also contain containerization. Um, the work package two focuses more towards efficient use of tools and 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 um, and knowledge around the tools and how do we uh, provide support around these tools. Um, so um, which which revolves around creating documentation and user uh, guides for researchers to use. Um, the, this work package also involves creating data catalogs and libraries, which can be readily available. These are specifically reference data sets, which, which could be used across multiple um, research areas and domains. Um, uh, this also focuses on creating, identifying tools which are not currently available uh, within these environments and and uh, and creating a catalog of tools and supporting them. Uh, the third work package is largely around upskilling the community itself based on the um, based on the based on the survey outcomes uh, which identified specific set of tools. Uh, one of the interesting outcomes from the survey was um, eighty percent of the researcher indicated that there are five common tools are, um, or software packages that they use so which means that if we if we can and, and they also indicated that there are challenges around applying or using those tools and techniques so uh, the focus largely is on uh, those identified um, five plus five ten tools which on machine learning as well as the data analysis part of um, stuff um, so the programs are tailored around uh, particularly particularly focusing on those identified set of tools um, but that also comes along with um, workshops and, and other collaborative events through which the, the researchers and use, users can come together and identify common challenges and, and, solve, um, and solve, 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 solve them together. Um, that, that leads to the uh, development of community of practices. So um, some of the outcomes from these activities are largely understanding what, what are the um, common um, uh, so, for example, if, if around computer vision, what are the common set of tools and challenges the users face, and how that can be um, aggregated and provided as a as a um, 
beginner training and and which has some some sort of follow-on approaches to provide inter intermediate and advanced courses um that's it for me thank you thanks so much Kamadi. okay so um hi Lisa. oh yes i will go back uh we have technically nine minutes left um but i'm hoping that we can uh just keep going so <laughs> all right take it away oh we can't hear you Okay, you need to now we can. <laughs> awesome. Hi everyone, um, and thanks Gary. Um, well, with Eco Commons, we are developing the go-to platform for researchers who are looking to find solutions to environmental and ecological challenges. And hopefully I'll be able to convince you why this is needed. Um, uh, so the current environmental challenges that our society has to deal with, um, they're all incredibly complex. And this is, these are all examples where people have to take biodiversity data and put them into an analytical workflows to derive solutions. And data exists in many different forms and shapes and formats and is offered by a whole variety of different providers. And choosing the right data set um, and the data quality that you need for the problem that you have at hand really depends on um, what the problem is that you're dealing with. So, Imagine you're a researcher, how can you make the most out of this very data-rich world that um, we live in? And this is where virtual laboratories come into play to make your life easier and reduce the time that you have to spend on data wrangling and configuring models and more time on actually solving this um, environmental challenges. So Eco Commons, in EcoCommons, we build virtual laboratories to bring all this great data that already exists all in one place to connect it with published methods and tools and analytical workflows and back this all up by high compute um, capacity and cloud storage. And so this slide is showing you how we do that. In Eco Commons, we have uh, three different streams um, that um, the team has been working on now for a couple of years. So the first stream is a place where we develop uh, new models and also we test them. And this is a command line environment that is uh, linked to high performance computation and cloud storage. Um, and we use it to develop new models uh, and put, uh, put them into microservices, but also our users can propose new models that um, they express the interest to turn them into microservices. Um, then uh, we have trusted, trusted um, domain focused, trusted models um, and platforms that already utilize those models that have been um, peer reviewed and accepted, adopted by the scientific community. And we have developed several virtual laboratories where users can go and use a point and click interface uh, that is super easy to use, but still scientifically very rigorous. And finally, we are developing custom-made decision support portals for specialized users. Um, currently, our specialized users are users from the government, so it's a very policy-driven uh, component that EcoCommons is dealing with. Um, so we are developing specialized virtual laboratories um, for users that would like to use the models and the outputs that already uh, exist in order to support their decisions. So this is EcoCommons in a nutshell. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elisa. So now I think we have Steve Kinnett with uh, Australia's drone cloud. drone cloud. Thank you. Yes, so my name is Steve Quinnell. I'm the chair of the Australian Scalable Drone Cloud Steering Committee and the CI from the host organisation. And I say the host organisation because this project is really about, about its five partners, their journey to digitise and, and, and make things more fair. Uh, and across those five organisations, we're covering a, a diverse and disruptive and national uh, research community. Um, and, I'll, and I'll show you some of that in the tick. Um, drones are really interesting and exciting because they're uh, sensing um, at this uh, critical scale gap between what we can do from planes and satellites and what you can do being physically on the ground. Uh, and because of that, becoming quite pervasive and, and involved in many disruptive research agendas. Uh, we don't want to see all the organisations repeat the same work and so we're, we've chosen to work together uh, to um, make this common framework. Um, so it'll happen in two ways. Uh, what we'll do is uh, on one level it's all about best practice around drone data analytics or processing uh, and it will be driven by five use cases from these five partners that straddle both fundamental research applications 
uh, industry-based applications and uh, national applications. And what I mean by that are the ones via the NCRIS capability areas and things along those lines. At the same time, we're dealing with another axis, which is some of those use cases are trying to build new pipelines, taking in new sensors and new tools. So it's really at the peak end of doing something really, really bespoke that you can't buy from uh, or, or, or get through open source things. So we're not writing the open source codes, but it's about tying those together. Um, and on the other end of it, it's uh, around some of the research agendas enabling the Australian public to be able to contribute into a commons and, and, and pipelines and things like that. So it has to really scale out. So we've got this really peak and long tail type of ecosystem we're going to try and um, provide the technology for and, and, and the common basis that enables uh, the fairness and the best practice to, to straddle those two axes. Um, and so our approach then is taking these five use cases from three national initiatives. So it's the APPF, the Australian Plant uh, Phenomics Facility, uh, OSCOPE, which is if you like the geoscience community. And, and we just heard uh, um, uh, about the eco commons and clouds, and that's really a part of um, a lot of what TURN does and the eco uh, terrestrial uh, space. Uh, similarly, we have facilities that build and uh, drones and do campaigns that actually run the drones for you, like the um, Monash Drones Discovery Platform. Um, and we have government agencies like CSIRO or, or major research labs who have a lot of industry links and things along those lines. Uh, and we're working together um, along these pipelines. Uh, so just to wrap it up, to give you a bit of a feel um, in, in terms of architecture, I'm not expect, expecting you to be able to read this, but it's just there to give you an idea. Uh, there was a bit of a, a map that takes all of the uh, adopt, uh, ad, adapt uh, and, and, and develop uh, uh, technologies that, that, the, that the partners have suggested that we'll trial and, um, and, to, uh, and to create this underpinning um, a pipelining environment that allows both that peak uh, VDI based advanced tools that push things off to HPC on one end uh, um, and at the moment the, the pilot example of that uh, was done by Oscope and it exists on the research cloud right now for example and uh, down to the other end which will be heavily Kubernetes based cloud native uh, leveraging things like say Eco Cloud or other Jupiter as a sort of service type of initiatives and things which are specific to drones such as Open Drone Map and those sorts of things. So they'll be tested and played with and trialed against these five pipeline uh, primary use cases uh, and uh, what you know the other things that the, the community pushes at us uh, during time uh, throughout time. Um, and to do that, to go through that journey, there is um, a project plan that's on the right hand side. That really is a journey of uh, five to six sprints, Uber sprints, um, that in, um, and we're coordinating the national community that's involved in this into these sort of two week sprints within those Uber um, uh, packages to, to, to deliver the whole program. Um, and what's really, really important is at the end of each Uber Sprint, uh, we re-engage with the user community, as in those pipelines, that steering committee, uh, to ensure that the technologies are appropriate um, and, and do a valuable role in the pipelines. And so that's our project. Thank you. Thanks very much, Steve. Um, and now we have the Cadre project. So we have another Steve presenting. <laughs> Hi Gary, it's uh, Dr. Stephen Keckerin here from the Australian Data Archive. So I'm presenting on the, the, the Cadre Coordinate Access for uh, Data Researchers and Environments uh, project. Our project is, uh, I suppose, a little bit different you know, to, to some of the other platforms. What we're interested in is establishing a platform for enabling uh, coordination of access to, um, uh, to data for researchers. Um, uh, basically an authority and um, a, approval uh, domain for, for that. So um, the Office of the National Data Commission is actually establishing a new framework and foundation legislatively for access to government data in Australia. What, but there isn't basically an implementation framework uh, for this. So while we might have the, the principles in place, um, actually be able to implement this uh, either procedurally or technically, uh, the, the, the framework isn't available. Um, so 
the sorts of challenges we're looking to address in um, in this are really dealing with access procedures, how to tie those into um, technologies and access controls, um, and mechanisms for storing and analysing data. Um, and say in the absence of those, um, our argument is that the expected value you can get from improved access will not be realised, uh, and you potentially have, you have potential further undermine trust because, say, you've you've promised uh, and are unable to deliver access to the content that's available. Okay, so uh, the aim of the the project is say there's a basic set of outcomes. Say is to bring this together in social sciences, humanities, and related disciplines um, for governance, creation, management, and sharing of sensitive data. Uh, we're trying to produce a conceptual framework, which, um, and that's really what I'm going to talk to in terms of our, our solution that's connected in the five states, which is a, an established framework now for uh, understanding the different uh, elements of um, uh, uh, the uh, design of um, access to um, sensitive systems. So the, the five safes, people, projects, data, settings and outputs. Uh, what we're looking to do is establish a mechanism for agreed identifiers for each of those elements of the five safes, accreditation protocols for the five, uh, for each of those five safes, uh, and then information exchange protocols um, for those um, uh, for those five safes indicators as well. Uh, and then an access management platform and pilot integrations across a set of um, for secure access settings. So some of those are already on this call, Erica uh, and, and Oren, as well as Arnet and the Data Co-ops group uh, at Swinburne and the Australian Data Archive where I'm based. Uh, the project's got um, about 10, 10 or 12 partners involved. Um, so I haven't brought in all the logos in here, um, but we're across a mix of e-research providers, government agencies and universities. So our basic, so this isn't a technical architecture, but our, our, what we're looking here is actually an architecture for thinking about the information exchange that, that we're interested in, uh, and some of the tech, the, the uh, standards and technology that we might be using to do that. So you know, we, we have involved um, AAF as one of the, the, the core partners as well. Uh, we're trying to leverage some of the, the principles of, that were established through the establishment of, of AAF, uh, and see if we can extend those to thinking about the types of indi um, identifiers that we might apply to the five face program uh, and this is some of our initial thinking of where those identifier systems might become so there's three three basic elements to each of those five domains people projects output settings and data um, so the, the 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 safe itself is in, um, uh, indicated in the in the circle the type of identifier and these pro provisional ideas for the identifiers we might use uh, orchids and diys on data DOIs on outputs, um, uh, raids potentially for the for projects, uh, and we're, we're certainly looking for an identifier system for applying to safe settings. That is the stack of um, hardware and software that might be associated with the delivery of a, a service between between domain. Uh, and then we the the other element to this is, or well, what are the attributes that you associate with those identifiers? So what are the, the accreditation systems that we can use, and how can we um, transfer that accredited information across organisations. We have models um, that in place, uh, things like grant applications in the, the project domain, but particularly we're picking up on some work done in the US, the research of passport system established by the Inter University I Consortium on Political and Social Research at the University of Michigan uh, as, a, as a model that's been adopted in the Australian, uh, in the US domain. And we're looking for similar sorts of frameworks um, across those other domains. That's it for me. Thank you very much, Steve. Thank you to all of our presenters today. Um, so we have three questions that have come through. Um, if you can, I know we've run out of time, but if you can bear with me, we will, I'll stop sharing my screen. Um, so the first question that we have is uh, for Voite. Um, if data curation is a second priority to publication and data is often non-reusable, does that impact on the capturing data provenance information in the platform? Um, I, I, I'll, I'll try to unpick this a little bit. So um, I don't know whether data curation is a second priority, but it's probably worthwhile to say that data capture and data analysis are primary priorities of the project. Um, so we consider it really important to capture data at the point of the experiment. And by doing that, we do a lot of things. 
were able to actually capture metadata when the researcher is actually performing the experiment and is in a good position to be able to record the metadata about the experiment. And we're also able to move that data pretty much immediately to somewhere more useful, which then alleviates the mechanics of, I, I guess, some of the challenges that you actually get with data curation. So, um, you know, data curation to me can mean a number of things. And where the way that we approach it in this in this particular project is to simplify some of the steps and the mechanics that you then need to do to do, do good data curation. I wouldn't call it a second priority. I would just call it that, that our, our first priority is, is, is on the, some of these mechanisms that are still a challenge when you're talking about very large data sets. Okay, thank you. So uh, the second question uh, for Louisa, what is the significance of the US Cloud Act on the sovereignty of Australian sensitive data stored with AWS or other American owned service providers? So we still have Louisa on, no, we don't. We'll have to take that one on notice. Um, so Louisa's had to go, sorry. Okay. so. Kamati, if you're still there, uh, can, you can you elaborate a little more on the community of practice for machine learning for house research, please? Yeah, sure. So um, with the AS, uh, for example, um, some of the faculties like law are interested in applying um, natural language processing for their research. So they've got volumes and volumes of data which needs to be analyzed or, or which needs to be first converted into structured format before they can apply any sort of machine learning to them. So um, uh, there, there are similar interests from other communities within HAS, which are looking at um, converting uh, data from unstructured to structured data. So uh, one area of community of practice would be around uh, natural language processing and, 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 and relevant machine learning techniques, which can be applied on those structured data. So uh, that's one example. Um, but as we as we go through, I think we we will understand more from the Has community. Okay, thank you very much. Well, thank you so much to all of our presenters. Uh, that was really interesting. Uh, as I said at the start, this was recorded, and all the slides will be made available. I'll send a link out to everyone who's registered. Um, just showing on this last slide, if you would like to read a little bit more about the projects. They are all on our website at that link there. So thank you again. Thank you for your interest in the program. Have a great day. Bye.